Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the keynote of the second day of FrostCon 2019. Um, yes, as you are all on a free and open source event, you are probably all citizens of the open source community um, or participating in some of these manner. The talk will be about uh, citizenship in the open source community or in the open source field. And I am very happy that we have uh, Molly uh, de Blanc here, who is a good citizen of this field <laughs> for quite some while. She was with the uh, Free Software Con Foundation for quite some while and is now with the GNOME Foundation. And yes, she will, she will tell you how to be a good citizen in the open source field. So the talk is about open source citizenship for everyone. Have fun. Thank you. Open source citizenship is for everyone. Open source has no borders and everyone is welcome to be a citizen. A quick disclaimer, I'll be reading my slides um, in case anybody is listening to the recording um, or the stream but not watching it or if anyone has any vision issues. Um, I will also be using the words or the phrases free software, open source and FOSS and FLOSS basically interchangeably. Um, this was a conscious decision on my behalf and I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, also, I really want to thank you before I get started um, for all the years you spent learning English, which allows me to deliver this talk in English because all I know how to say in German is ein espresso bitte. Um, I also know how to say zwei espresso bitte. So if anybody wants me to order them an espresso later, I've got you covered. <laughs> so open source citizen, what is an open source citizen? Open source citizen is a noun, right? It's Anyone involved with FOSS, that means users, contributors, developers, organizations, or anybody who's interacting with and touching free software and free and open source technology. Um, this means basically everyone in the world who is interacting with some kind of computing device has the potential to take on a role as an active open source citizen. Um, I first heard the term open source citizen at Open Source Bridge, which was a conference in Portland, Oregon. Um, so I'd really like to give them some props uh, for coining, for as far as I know, coining it. Um, and it's really taken off when people want to talk about our role as community members. One of the things that I really like about the term citizen uh, and citizenship is that it implies that open source is a place that we're in. It's a place we can be from. Um, when I introduce myself frequently, I say, hi, I'm Molly DeBlanc. Uh, I'm from the United States. I'm also Molly DB, and I'm from the internet, um, because I exist pretty much on the internet, and that's kind of who I am in that sphere, in that space. Um, but so open source is also a space I'm from. So I can say to someone, hi, I'm Molly, and I'm from free software. Um, and I think that's really cool. Um, Something else I like about the term citizen is we talk about the free software movement and we talk about the open source movement. And movements are these things that last for a while uh, and then reach some goal and are successful, ideally. Um, but when you're a citizen, you can continue to exist in a space even when a movement has been successful. Uh, and I think that's really great. Um, uh, this is not supposed to be a person. This is supposed to be the keyhole design with a little Thing inserted in it, but I realize that's not obvious, so I'm going to explain. So I explained it. Um, open source is also a thing that we're a part of, uh, and we're here with others. We're not alone. Like everyone in this room uh, is or has the potential to be an active open source citizen, and I think that's really cool. Um, active citizenship is a noun as well. Active citizenship is the idea that we have rights and responsibilities. Uh, where we're interacting in the places where we're citizens. So that means that as free software using individuals and users includes developers and contributors, um, we have rights and responsibilities. So we're going to spend some time talking about what rights we have, what those look like, and then what our responsibilities are. So uh, Rights are these ideas and these things that we are fundamentally entitled to. Uh, and one of the ways that we talk about rights and we describe them is we use freedoms. We have the freedom to do something. 
Richard Stallman in the 80s, 1980s, codified the idea of free software by saying there are four freedoms to the digital rights tech, to, to your digital rights with response to technology. Um, over the years, they've been paraphrased and reworded by many people, and we've kind of settled on the idea that you have the right to the freedom to use, copy, modify, and share software. Um, I would also argue, I would go as far to argue that this is true for more than just software technology, um, but that's a very separate conversation and that's a very big conversation. So we have the, the right to use software how we want to use it, to take copies of it, to change what we have to make it work better for ourselves or for others, and then to share both what we do when we modify something, but the original version as well. We do amazing things with these rights. It's so, it blows me away whenever I think about all the things free software does. Free software is in space and sends people to space. And that's so cool and inspiring, right? Free software is being used to clean up waterways and oceans. Uh, nonprofits and NGOs that are making real change in this world and having a positive impact are also running on free software, right? I think that's really cool. Um, I also directly benefit from free software. Um, I am, I'm bipolar, um, and my treatment and infrastructure, like my treatment plan and the infrastructure I use to manage my life and manage my bipolar disorder is based on free software. Um, uh, I have an idea for an app about mood tracking that doesn't exist yet, so if anybody wants to get in on making me an app that I will not pay you for, um, and needs to have a, a free license, which is the problem with a lot of the apps I looked at. Um, I don't actually know if my DMs on Twitter are open. I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, but I think you can request to send me messages. So you can, you can message me if you want. Um, the, the biggest thing I use is uh, encrypted communication. Um, I use Signal, I use IRC. Um, uh, and I use these tools to talk with my support network. So my support network includes my friends and my family. Um, they're the people that I talk with when I'm having trouble, when I need support, um, when there are problems. Um, and then there are people I just talk with in general. And because I have these secure encrypted spaces that I trust, where I can talk with these people, I feel a lot better being open. It's taken me years, years of effort and work by com through communicating with friends to be able to stand in front of a group of people and say, hey guys, I'm bipolar. Um, and that's a really big deal for me. Um, so I also uh, talk with my doctors about free software and my treatment. Um, somebody once told me that there's no bad place to talk about free software and user freedom and that the doctor's office is a great place. Um, so I have an appointment, I have an unscheduled appointment with my therapist to teach her how to use encrypted email. Um, so someday we're going we're gonna to get on that train as well, and I'm really excited about it. Um, also, uh, a big part of my coping is listening to podcasts and books on tape. And by books on tape, I mean Harry Potter. Um, and these are things that I do all over all over, I do it, I listen to podcasts in Harry Potter on planes, I do it when camping. Um, you know, we get a lot of comfort when we are listening, reading, or watching something that we've seen before and like. Like, rewatching is very much a thing. Um, so I get a lot of comfort from it. Um, uh, I like to say that Harry Potter saved my life, not because I was waiting for the final book to come out to find out what happened, but because I've had this source of comfort and this thing that is keeping me company while I'm waiting. Uh, depression, for those of you who have not been depressed, uh, is a lot of waiting. You wait until you can go to bed uh, at night if you're having trouble sleeping, or if you're sleeping too much, you're waiting until you wake up. Um, then when you're awake, you wait until there's the next thing that you have to do. And filling those hours can be really hard. But when you have a book on tape uh, or a podcast or something like that that's keeping you company, something that's familiar, you know, those hours suddenly don't seem so bad. Um, it's important to note that a lot of media is, in fact, uh, 
you know, locked down with DRM and is proprietary, and that's a problem. Um, and a lot of the tools that people use to listen to podcasts, for example, are proprietary as well. So I'd kind of make an aside here to ask you, uh, if you are developing these tools or you are making media, please make them DRM free so that people like me can benefit from having this source of comfort and this connection regardless of where we are. Um, I'd also kind of note here that uh, I had a really bad depressed period for a while and the only thing that made me laugh for months was Reply All. So I recommend Reply All um, and they're pretty cool guys. Um, so we actually, so we have this responsibility to be open source citizens and to be good open source citizens. Um, the question I first asked myself when I thought about this is, does everyone have the responsibility to push the movement forward and to change the paradigm of technology? And the answer is no. Um, well, at least not in big ways. Not everybody has to become a free software zealot or an evangelist. Right? By using a piece of free software, by being a good citizen, you are slowly helping to make these changes in the world. And that's valuable into itself. Um, responsibilities are something we share. They're things we do together. Um, and that makes it a lot easier. But it also makes it more fun to have responsibilities when they're not something you're doing alone, but they're something that you're doing in social uh, contexts. One of these is empathy. We want to be approaching everything with empathy, especially towards users. A lot of the technology that we build is built for us, uh, for us as individuals. We think about our own experiences when we're designing something. We think about, we use data sets that we're familiar with and comfortable with when we're teaching computers how to do things um, or when we're testing stuff out. So we need to think about all the people out there who are different than you and their needs. Right, so one of the things with empathy is we're not just thinking about what somebody's needs are, but we're also thinking about how they feel in different situations. Um, so we can think about some obvious things or things that I hope or think are obvious, maybe they're not, um, such as people with physical disabilities, people who are blind, people have mobility impairment. Um, then there are people like me, right? people who uh, are neuroatypical and have mental health issues and concerns. Um, there are also people with slow internet access uh, who are in places where they barely have internet um, but are still relying on it or that internet access is very slow. Um, I was biking, I was on a bike tour and I went through uh, New York State and I stopped in Washington County which was this random rural county and I found out that they didn't have internet access there. And it blew my mind because I was like, I'm in the United States and your entire internet access is just data plans? That's ridiculous. Um, but that's, that's something like very real people have. Um, also, uh, things people who are only using mobile devices. Um, I read, I found out when writing this that there's an estimated 4.5 billion mobile devices out there um, and mobile device users uh, which is an incredibly large number and a significant portion of the global population. Um, so in 2008, I lived in Mongolia. And when I was in Mongolia, this was before uh, smartphones, but one of the things I noticed is everyone I met had a cell phone. And when I was traveling through the countryside, like staying with people who had semi-nomadic lifestyles, they also still had cell phones. Um, and I assume that now a lot of people have mobile phones. I know that there are different parts of Africa um, where um, mobile devices are really common um, in spite of people lacking, other lacking access to other technologies. Um, so you have this pocket computer, and that's a thing that we need to be designing for and thinking about. Um, an example is facial recognition technology when we're thinking about empathy and design. Um, I think facial recognition technology rather famously uh, is known to be bad. The canonical example of this, um, in the United States at least, is that most facial recognition technology is really bad at recognizing black people. Um, and either doesn't recognize them as people or mixes them up for one another quite frequently because the data sets a lot of computers have been trained on uh, are predominantly white faces. Um, now, facial recognition technology is actually being deployed in some really cool ways. Um, it's being deployed in airports uh, to smooth the check-in process to your flight, which is pretty neat. Um, it also scares me, uh, but I think it's pretty neat. 
and um, it's used as, so you can check into your flight and you can check out of stores now with facial recognition technology, which is also pretty cool, um, though also has a lot of problems, which we're not gonna talk about because we're focusing on the cool part of facial recognition technology. Um, you know, uh, and that's, that's great, but if there's problems with being able to differentiate people who don't look like the developers, then like, that's a huge issue and suddenly we're looking at a piece of technology that is fundamentally broken um, and in fact discriminates against individuals and then we're furthering a society that's discriminating against individuals. Um, facial recognition technology is also being used by cops um, and police officers. I read that in Hong Kong or I heard that in Hong Kong um, facial recognition technology is being deployed at the protests right now um, and people have been using lasers to counter it, which I think is really cool, because lasers are cool. Um, but I also thought this was interesting because I read a book, I think it was a Cory Doctorow book, though I'm not sure, uh, where people were using lasers to uh, counter um, surveillance cameras. So it turns out that that works in real life as well as books. Um, so we need to consider those sort of situations. I read this book a few years ago, uh, but there was some truth in the science fiction. And there's actually a lot of truth in science fiction. Science fiction does a really good job at predicting what's gonna happen in the future um, and the kinds of problems we'll have, but also the extent to which technology can develop and the things technology can do. Uh, so one of the things we need to consider are utopias. Right? Let's think about the, the beauty of the free software utopia, which is a term I heard from Deb Nicholson, props to Deb Nicholson. Um, and the wonderful things technology can do. Let's think about the most amazing end results for our tools that we're developing and making, and then let's ask ourselves, how can we make sure that these work for everyone? We also need to think about dystopias and the terrible things people can do with our technology. Thinking about the surveillance and the monitoring and the discrimination, and try to build in ways and use our influence to counter that, right? So a question that um, I first heard uh, from people designing weapons and military technology um, is are we responsible for what people are doing with our work? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I don't have a firm opinion either way because I see a lot of good arguments on both sides. But these are still things that we need to be considering and thinking about. Um, so we want people to use our powers for good. We want people to use their powers for good um, or awesome. But at least we don't want them to use them for evil. And sometimes we try to force this to happen with licensing. Licenses are the backbone of free software, right? They're this legal hack. And without them, we wouldn't be able to have free software. We wouldn't be able to protect people's rights and freedoms with technology. So there are a few things people came up with. Um, this example and the next example are ones that I learned from Alana Hashman. Um, she's great. Uh, you should look her up. Uh, I see somebody giggling. I like that. Um, so uh, credit where credit is due. So there's the Anti-996 license. And the Anti-996 license was created in response to working conditions in Chinese, uh, like, in Chinese firms. Um, and one of the stipulations it has, and a restriction it has, is that you have to follow local labor laws um, when developing this software, software that uses this license. No, that sounds great, right? You're, you're limiting the number of hours people can work, you're limiting discrimination. Um, but also it turns out that there are countries in the world where people, especially women, can't work without permission from their husbands or fathers. So suddenly you have this contribution community where even though it's an open contribution community and it's a piece of free software, suddenly you have this whole category of people who might be excited to work on it, even as volunteers, who can't because it's against local labor laws. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to participate in a community and I don't want to be a citizen of a space where a huge category of people can't participate because of this stipulation and because of these laws. Uh, there. There are also do no harm licenses. Um, so a do no harm license has a clause saying that you can use this license but not for evil. And then evil is described in some capacity. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's not described in some capacity. And that's also a problem. 
um, because of ambiguity creates, but it is a problem for other reasons as well. Sorry for the mini tangent. Um, uh, do you know harm licenses? So I, I think it's iTunes has a clause where you can't use it to develop nuclear weapons. Um, and so there are some things like that. But something you're seeing more commonly is no government use or no military use. So that might seem like a good idea, but if you think about the other parts of governments and militaries that are still using those, that might be using those technologies or are using those technologies that are doing good work. So for example, you might have a National Weather Service that is using some of the same tools that the military is using in order to get the weather for everyone. And I like being able to check the weather and knowing what's gonna happen and when it's gonna rain. Um, so I'm not a big fan of that idea. All right. The other thing is that these licenses are just not free. Um, and they're not open either. So when we describe an open license, what we're saying is that that license meets these, these points of uh, the, there's the open source definition. And the open source definition is a list of points that licenses must uh, meet in order to be considered open. And the free software Foundation maintain also main, that's maintained by the Open Source Initiative, and then the Free Software Foundation also maintains a list of licenses um, that they deem to be free. Uh, so one of the things with the open source definition is by placing restrictions on use, you're rendering a license non-open. Right? When you have a license that's not uh, that has restrictions on use, it's not free because suddenly people can't use the software for whatever they want. So in addition to having practical negative effects. Uh, there are also these freedom uh, impacts, right? So what can we do? Well, we can use our collective power to push others to do better. We don't have to do this alone, and we don't have to try to use licensing tactics to reach the ends we want to see. One of the things you can do is you can work to make sure that the software you're developing is still free. Um, one of the ways to do this is through employment contracts. Um, I know some great lawyers and some organizations, the Software Freedom Conservancy has a project called Contract Patch that is working on this. Um, and the idea is to get built into your employment contracts that your soft, that, like this licensing clause. Um, and I know some people who've done it very successfully. So it's a thing to look into and a possibility to consider. The other thing is stuff like the Tech Won't Build It movement. Um, tech Won't Build It is really based on collective organizing. Um, perhaps one of the most successful actions of collective organizing um, among tech workers was Project Dragonfly, uh, relating to Project Dragonfly, which was a Google initiative to create a censored search engine for China. Um, and Google employees uh, got together and started this action saying, we're not supposed to have this, we can't have this, we won't build it. Um, and that was huge and powerful. Uh, Salesforce and Microsoft um, uh, employees have also taken stances against collaboration with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, in the United States, um, which has not been the best organization over the past few months, um, which I will, can talk with you about more not when I'm giving a talk that's being recorded. Um, uh, also, whistleblowing. Whistleblowers are like very important. Right? We have people like the Cambridge Analytica scandal. We have people like Edward Snowden. We have these individuals and these like, collectives of people who are coming out saying that this company is doing something wrong. So rather than trying to force companies by restricting the freedoms of individuals uh, and organizations, they're using their other powers to make a difference. Right? We also have the responsibility of building good communities. Good communities are great. I like them. Um, building, build, building a good community means we can build better technology, um, which means we can build a better future. Uh, and open source is a place where everyone is welcome to be a citizen. We have to make sure that's true. And again, this is the kind of thing we can do together. This is not something that we have to do by ourselves. Um, so we can participate in these ways by creating resources, by mentoring people, by, and mentoring doesn't have to be a months long or a lifelong commitment. It can be the kind of thing where you help someone with a small project or give them advice in an individual situation. Right? Um, 
Diverse communities are just the right thing to do. This is something I believe very firmly. You don't always have to have practical explanations for why you should do something, right? We don't actually have to have practical explanations as to why we should have digital rights. We have rights. Um, diverse communities are a really good thing, and it's good to have a space where everyone is welcome. There are practical benefits for having diverse communities, right? There's a lot of really good things that come out of having diverse communities when you're building software and technology. Um, but we're not gonna talk about those right now. Um, something else that we do when we build diverse communities is we're looking to build equity. Equity is the idea that um, we're all coming from different places, right? So where I'm starting from is different from where you're starting from, and that could be because of education or um, a socioeconomic background because of race or gender or ethnicity, um, and that we need to provide people with different kinds of starting points. We need to help them and provide them with different kinds of resources. So somebody who doesn't speak English as a native language but is working in an English language project might need more help with their communication and might need more empathy with their communication uh, in order to be as successful as someone else. Right? Um, diverse communities are good. And we need to think about a range of metrics when we think about diversity, right? We've already discussed some of them. We've talked about physical abilities. We've talked about race. We've talked about gender. Um, but there are other things that we can talk about as well. Like I mentioned, people who are neuroatypical. Um, the first free software contributor I met who was a peer of mine, like in my age group, had cerebral palsy. Um, so he was coming at it from this completely different physical interaction standpoint than I was. Um, we have geography, right? We come from all over the world. We all speak different languages. We have different needs. We have different holidays and different cultural sensitivities um, that we need to keep uh, in mind. We also have different professional and academic backgrounds. Um, and that's important to remember when making assumptions about what other people know. Uh, but it's also important to remember when making assumptions about what other people can do. So skill level is one example of a piece of diversity we might not be thinking about very much. Um, so I work for the GNOME Foundation, or GNOME Foundation, the G stands for freedom. Um, and last year, the GNOME Foundation switched from using a bunch of disparate pieces of technology to manage the project to keeping everything in GitHub, uh, GitLab. Um, in their own instance of GitLab. Uh, and there's a lot of really cool stuff about that. One of the things that happened is um, there were newcomers, to, there was an increased number of newcomers to the project. That's ANIC data, um, because it wasn't possible to track things very well beforehand since everything was being kept in a different place. Um, but also, other teams started to use it. So it wasn't just the teams developing software. I'm involved with the engagement team, um, and we, use, we keep track of issues and assets and files all in GitLab. So GitLab is this tool that has really helped uh, equalize the playing field um, for people who want to contribute to the project, but previously would have, might have had a harder time by like, getting into one part of the project that was using tools they didn't already know, since Git is like, pretty standard these days. Um, there's also commitment level. I first heard the term drive-through contributor uh, from Deb Nicholson and Vicky Bresser. Um, and a drive-through contributor is somebody who shows up, who makes one change, one commit, one bug report. Uh, maybe they fix some grammar on your wiki. So they make this small thing, this small edit, um, but they're still valuable. Um, and you still want them to be welcome, and you want them to know, and people who want to be drive-through contributors, that they can show up and they can do these things, and they're going to be just as valued uh, for their contribution as somebody who's been sticking around this like for a long time um, and that every contribution is valuable. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that we want to do with our communities is make these spaces where people can do that. One of the tools we have for that is community guidelines. Um, community guidelines are things like anti-harassment policies or codes of conduct, communication guidelines. Uh, these are tools that we use this is one of the tools, one of the resources we have to try to make sure that everybody is welcome and feels welcome uh, within a space. So I heard, um, so the Gnome Foundation recently announced an inclusion and diversity initiative, and unsurprisingly, there was some pushback. 
uh, against it. And one of the things somebody said was that, um, I don't know the gender of any GNOME contributors. And I thought this was really interesting, and it kind of was like percolating in my head for a few days. Um, and I realized that this was weird to me because I'm also involved with the Debian project, and I know the gender of lots of Debian contributors. I've had like some really in-depth discussions with people in Debian about their gender. Um, and that's because we have these social spaces. So as somebody who's an end user of a project, somebody who's not participating in it, you might not have any experience with what's going on behind the scenes, right? And that's fine. Um, but if you're involved in a project, if you're participating in it, you know that you need to participate in these social spaces. You need to hack along with people. You need to develop friendships. You need to share fun times. Um, events like this, right? We're not just here for the talks. We're here to talk to each other um, and to go to the parties and have fun. And that's huge for projects, right? People show up because they're interested, but they stick around because they like people um, and they like the community. And that's really big. Uh, fun is necessary uh, to a successful free software project. Um, and when you have a community that's trying to have fun and you're excluding a bunch of people or making a bunch of people who are there unwelcome, then suddenly you don't actually have a good community anymore and the fun part stops existing and you stop having a good project. And that's a major problem when you're trying to affect real change. Um, building spaces where everyone is welcome can be really hard, uh, but it's worth it. Um, you, can also get, you also have the responsibility to give back to the community. Um, we want to give back to projects we benefit from and the general ecosystem of FOSS. Um, so that can look a bunch of different ways, right? I use VLC all the time. Um, I might have given the VLC project some money at one point. I don't actually know if you can do that. Um, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, we'll see. Uh, but I do a lot of other stuff for free software um, and I am involved with the greater free software movement so I like to think that even by just mentioning VLC, like I'm doing a little bit to help bring awareness to what, what's going on with that. Um, uh, spreading the good word is really important and it totally helps. And whether spreading the good word is something as basic as suggesting to someone a piece of software that they might like to try, um, having an in-depth conversation or going and petitioning your local government to uh, enact better digital rights bills and legislation and like switch their computers to free software, like those, those are all very valid forms of giving back. But also there are things you can do like code. When I say code here, um, I'm kind of using it as a placeholder for contributions. Um, there are lots of different kind of contributions you can make. And part of being a good open source citizen is making those contributions. So there's code work and design work, translations, um, you can help with marketing, you can manage a social media account, you can create a brochure, you can do all sorts of things uh, that are these, some of them are quantitative, some of them are qualitative contributions uh, to these projects. Um, and that makes a really big difference and that helps create sustainable projects and projects that have longevity um, and projects that are just good and easy to use and that's huge. You can give money, financial support. Um, it's fine if you can't give money and financial support, but if you can, that's pretty cool. Um, projects need resources, they need financial resources. Uh, whether what you're doing is you're running infrastructure, so you need servers to support the work you're doing. Um, maybe you wanna pay for some developer time, maybe you wanna pay for a conference, or help somebody uh, who's in your community go to a conference to spread the word, or afford a booth, or make stickers. Um, these are like, these, some of these things are like standard now and they all cost, fun, like they cost money. Um, so by donating to a project, that's a big deal and that really helps. Um, if you have a project and you want to accept donations and you're not set up to do that right now, that's a conversation that I'm happy to have with people later. I have some advice on those sorts of things. Um, that's an aside. There's also volunteering. Um, there are a lot of great nonprofits working in FOSS and digital rights. Um, we have the FSFE and the FSF, um, there's FSFI, I don't know much about them. Um, there's the Open Source Initiative and APRIL and La Quadrature du Net and 
Uh, the list goes on for all the, the Software Freedom Conservancy, and I could keep going, the Apache Software Foundation. Um, I need to stop or I'm going to keep going. Um, and these organizations need volunteers, right? And some of the volunteering roles are things like managing infrastructure or doing those kind of coding contributions. But a lot of the stuff that they also need is they need people to staff booths. They just need bodies to be at events. They need people to give talks about their work. Um, and they need people to stuff envelopes. Stuffing envelopes is actually this really big thing. Uh, that's kind of tedious. And another thing that you can do is be a friendly face, um, whether that's online or in person. And you can be a friendly face even when you have social anxiety, like I do. It's great. Um, and you can use your influence to help others be good open source citizens, right? We have immense influence. Right? We, we have a skill set that is disproportionately valued across the world. Um, and we can use that to affect real change, both in our companies, like in our organizations, in our communities, and with other people that we're interacting with. So organizations are also culpable. It's, organizations also have the responsibility to be good open source citizens. Right? Organizations, uh, by the way, include schools, nonprofits, NGOs, governments, companies. Um, they can give back in much the same ways uh, as we can give back as individuals. So by contributing code, by donating uh, and contributing employee time, right? Um, so when you're contributing employee time, what you're doing is you're not just giving the project work that you're already doing, but you're helping them work on the things that they think is valuable and important. Right? This is especially important when it comes to things like accessibility. Um, accessibility is necessary for many users, uh, and it's a very particular skill set and a very particular like, analyzation set. So a company donating time for something like that is huge for a project, and it makes a big difference. There's giving money. Um, uh, and like supporting projects and events financially. That is also big because there's infrastructure and things that are necessary. When a company or an organization gives you or gives your project a big chunk of cash, then suddenly you have the ability to like hire a developer to work on something particularly difficult. You could participate in a program like Outreachy and fund an intern to help somebody get involved in free software, but also like help your project move further along. And then there's volunteering, right? So some companies offer to their employees the ability to use volunteer time out of their work time, and it's kind of considered a donation to an organization. Um, and that's pretty cool. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you can take advantage of. And if these are things that your um, companies don't offer, it's the sort of work that you can push for and the sort of benefits you can push for, uh, which is, like one of the things you can do with your immense power in your companies. <laughs> um, companies benefit and need to pass that on. Uh, a lot of companies, especially tech companies, even if they're not developing free software, are using free software and getting immense benefit from the work people are doing, um, from the work that contributors are doing, that volunteers are doing. Like they're not paying for a lot of their infrastructure. Um, so they are in a way, even more responsible to give back in bigger ways than we are as individuals, right? Um, a bunch of companies are opening open source programs offices, which I think is pretty cool. So they're even taking the step of acknowledging that they need to be better open source citizens. Um, so here are some takeaways that I hope you'll have uh, from the talk. Um, creating a strong community uh, creates a strong movement. So by being good citizens, we're creating strong communities because we're getting together, we're making change, we're inspiring others, we're inspiring others who are already participating to do more. Um, and that is like huge, right? So creating a strong com community creates a strong movement and the goal of the movement is to create change where all software is free, right? We want to live in a reality where all technology is free, where all technology respects our rights, where everything respects user freedom. Um, and the only way we can do that is by being good citizens and by working together. 
free software can change the world. Free software is already changing the world. It's doing amazing things, and we're doing amazing things with it. Um, it is impacting individuals like myself uh, and making real differences, a real difference in my life. Uh, it's impacting environmental work. It's impacting um, social justice work. It's making a big difference for organizations like FrostCon. Um, uh, which in turn is giving us all the opportunity to come together and to make change, and that's great. But these are, the, these are things that we can only do together by working with one another and collaborating. Um, so I'd like to say that, uh, hi, <laughs> I'm Molly DeBlanc. Um, I work for the GNOME Foundation. Um, I serve on the board of the Open Source Initiative. Um, I'm president of the board. I'm a member of the Debian Project. I volunteer for the Software Freedom Conservancy and the Free Software Foundation, doing things in some cases like stuffing envelopes, which you can do too, especially if you live in the Boston area. Um, and I donate to organizations. I give to Public Lab, which does great work with citizen science. I recently donated to PyCon Africa. Um, and I also give to other projects and digital rights organizations. And above all, I'm an open source citizen. Right? And that's the thing that I think really matters. So I'd like to thank you all. That's a frond, because you're my fronds now. Because you did, I don't know. Um, thanks for the, the pity laugh there. That was good. Um, so thank you very much. Yes, uh, I would like to thank you first for the great <laughs> talk. Um, are there questions? Hi, uh, this is Pavi. I see a lot of fragmentation in free software or open source community. A lot of people are like, of course, many people have diverse views, but I see that many communities are breaking apart. Um, we used to have like huge numbers in, in many free software events, but the numbers are falling down. Uh, of course, you have mentioned that we all become citizens and we have responsibility as citizens. But I see movements are, you know, falling down. Is there anything which you could suggest for this? Is there anything we can do to strengthen communities? Um, so some tactics that you can use are having newcomer events um, and being friendly. That's something that the GNOME Foundation does um, and other organizations certainly do. Uh, where we welcome people by teaching them how to make their first contribution to the project, by helping them along with that. Um, with GNOME, they're themed, usually. So it's like, we're going to be working on GTK, or we're going to be working on GStreamer, or we're going to have an engagement team sprint, where we're going to talk about our social media strategy and develop some cool assets and like pictures. Um, so newcomer events are a really useful thing that you can be doing. Um, there's, uh, what else do people do? Um, if you have a project um, or a community that can support it, having an intern um, or interns makes a big difference. So there's Google Summer of Code, um, which helps grow communities, and there's Outreachy. Outreachy is a project that's focused on uh, internships uh, in free software for uh, people who come from backgrounds that are marginalized in their communities. Um, so, uh, and that encompasses a lot of different kinds of individuals. Um, so those are some things that are focused on getting people involved. Having big event, like having speakers in local languages, I say as I'm standing here speaking English in Germany, um, is a, a really big deal actually, um, because that makes things more accessible. Translating materials into local languages uh, and making sure those resources are available is huge. Um, uh, so those are some things. And just having lots of events um, that people are welcome at makes a big difference. Um, because if you can show up for something, my, my, like, my free software story is like, I showed up for something because it was easy. And I'm usually one of the last people to leave because I feel guilty. I, like, I, I don't know when I'm supposed to leave events, uh, see social anxiety. Um, uh, 
So I would like hang around and then I'd start stacking chairs to help clean up because I didn't know what else to do. Um, and after you stack chairs for a while, you start kind of collecting other responsibilities and they ask you to do more things and that's how I got involved. Um, so just creating spaces for people to come together and to interact with each other and having them be welcoming spaces where everyone can show up is, is big. More questions? Comments? Thoughts, feelings? Hi, thank you, Molly. Um, I just have a curious question based on the question earlier. So, the, uh, Papi, you mentioned that the number of open source contributors dropped during the last few years, but I think that I disagree with that. <laughs> um, we, um, do we really have the number of people uh, that contribute to open source statistics available somewhere that say that the community becomes smaller or drop down because I can see right now uh, let's say a conference like Foscon or Fosdom you see more and more people keep coming and in Asia a lot of if you from, come from India right a lot of young contributors uh, are keep coming so, 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 so I don't think that there is a, um, we have to be sad about the future of open source now so many companies started to adopt open source everywhere and we even uh, a few months ago when I went back to, uh, to Vietnam, went to high school to talk about open source, then I was really surprised that uh, students, sixth ray and seventh ray, a lot of them use Arch Linux. And you know that, uh, you know how much will Microsoft uh, pay the education, but now very young students only know how to use Arch Linux. So if there is any statistic available somewhere that showing the number of open source contributors dropped out over the year, please show to us, because I don't believe this is the case at the moment. And if you see the release on GitHub just two days ago, they said, oh, uh, we have now 40 million developers on GitHub. So the, pe the people that are on uh, the developers that are available out there to work on open source, I think the numbers keep increasing. And the, the problem that we see right now is you see that the age of the community also get older and we don't want to see the same faces everywhere we go. So we need to be more friendly and welcome so that we have young changing generation involved. And I think that uh, what we can do is um, now in Asia and everywhere, people start to bring open source in their education for younger generation. So you don't wait until, okay, try to recruit developer to our community, but spread the idea like Molly mentioned. Uh, to other people, something very basic, and it's happened already everywhere around the world, so in China, in India, so we have a very bright future. So I don't want us to think that, okay, so sad now everyone leaving free software. This, I don't think this is the case. So I think that, so to build off of that, um, I think that a lot of people are joining in, that we're seeing a lot of use, especially in the, like, the greater concept of what it means to be an open source citizen, uh, in places like schools. Um, I think that there are definitely individual projects that are losing contributors. Um, I think there are noticeably people who are leaving free software and making those decisions to do it because they feel unwelcome in communities. Um, uh, and um, I think individual communities might feel like they're losing people as well. Questions, questions? Questions, comments? Okay. Um, so you briefly spoke about non-open licenses during your talk, and I think everyone here agrees that open source licenses have an important place in the world, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be at an open source conference. Um, but what are your thoughts on the place in the world for non-open licenses? Is there one, and if so, what is it? I don't think we should have non-open licenses. <laughs> um, uh, there's... Uh, there are a lot of arguments I've heard about closed light. Like, I'm very sympathetic to the idea, especially of do no harm licenses and do no evil licenses, um, because I think everybody's heart is in the right place. Um, and that I would like to see, you know, I wouldn't like to see Nazis using my, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that here. I'm sorry. Uh, big topic in the US right now. <laughs> Feel really awkward. <laughs> Okay, we don't want to see uh, terrible people who kill kittens um, using our software. Uh, 
But unfortunately, we live in a reality where by placing restrictions on people who, evil people who kill kittens, we're also then placing restrictions on everybody else. Um, uh, so unfortunately, I don't think we're in a place right now uh, and I, I kind of don't think we're ever really going to be in a place where proprietary licenses uh, are the way to go, um, even in edge cases. I'm also especially encouraging of questions from women and non-binary individuals, too, if you're nervous about asking one. But I think I see a hand up there. Okay. Well, we had already at least one woman. <laughs> If anybody so. wants to, you know, just, just opening the floor to that. Um, in the recent, uh, I think, half a year, there were, was a bunch of companies who um, yeah, tried to um, take their, their software away from an open license to a more close or proprietary license in order to be able to monetize their, their software. What do you think about um, yeah, companies trying to monetize software in general? Because yeah, I've just heard about it um, on, in the Redis talk in, in the last session. Yeah, what do you think about it? Uh, I think monetizing your software is great um, and that people should do it. I love making a salary. Um, I don't do development and I don't work for a tech company. I work for a tech nonprofit. Um, but certainly we get lots of donations from companies that are making lots of money on software and individuals who are making lots of money on software. Uh, and that's great. Um, so I think monetizing software is a good thing. Um, I think by existing in a world where all technology, so this is like, this, gets, this opens up to a potentially really complicated conversation. Uh, but to try to skirt from getting too deep into it, um, one of the things, We'll just be making less money than we are now when all software is free, right? Um, like, that's just a reality of it uh, because we'll be selling less things. That doesn't mean that, like, a lot of, um, a lot of company or some company, company I know of companies uh, that do monetiz monetization through custom development. Um, and that they then take that, those, like, take that code and take that work and upstream it and like, package it for everyone, which is also good for the individual companies that are, or the people who are hiring them to do that work because it means that um, updates and versions of it will benefit from the practical benefits of being in an open source ecosystem, um, but also uh, future versions of the base software will be more compatible with those modules that they're building. Um, and that's like, so that's like one very practical thing we can say. Um, uh, there's another conversation that one could have um, about how uh, there's a future where all technology is free and in that future money is much less of an issue. And I'm not going to get into that right now because that's a big conversation. More questions? I like answering questions because it's, it's easier than coming up with a talk. <laughs> and drawing these slides, man, that takes so long. It doesn't um, seem that people want to speak up with their questions okay. now. Maybe they come in a more individual yeah. Conversation that's also fine, I believe. Uh, or are thinking about what you told them. Yeah. Or... I have chocolate, if anybody wants some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough for everyone. <laughs> I believe um, there's a lot to think about or to implement mm -hmm. uh, in your daily work or whatever. Um, yes, thank you for your talk, Molly. Um, I believe everybody enjoyed it. Yay. And um, yes. I don't think that the language was any issue at all. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Yeah.